you. Good morning. I'm so pleased to welcome you to CSU OT's 19th annual and first virtual knowledge exchange. As Karen said, my name is Anita Bundy and I'm the department head in occupational therapy. I've just completed five years in this role. As a department, we've changed and grown a lot in that five years. Our accomplishments, however, are not about me. They're about this whole team, which also has changed and grown. We have one new staff member and seven new faculty, plus one to join us in August. We retired two faculty and one staff member. Indulge me for a few minutes while I describe some of our achievements. Our research productivity has skyrocketed. Our publications more than doubled. Our grant submissions grew 24 fold. And while we've focused a lot on research, we've also kept our eye on excellent education. We maintained a 100% pass rate on the registration exam. We developed a new entry level degree program to begin in 2022, the professional doctorate. We met all CSU and state of Colorado requirements and we're well into the candidacy process with our accrediting body. US News and World Report and Best Value Schools continue to list us in the top 10 OT programs nationally and we retained our status with CSU as a program of research and scholarly excellence. We acquired 4,000 square feet of new space in Alder Hall, just across the railroad tracks from the OT building. The Center for Community Partnerships now resides there. We have two new labs on the Foothills campus, a new lab in music therapy, and a new lab in health and exercise science. The best acquisition, however, is a new accessible bathroom on the second floor of the OT building. This next summer, CSU will renovate our first floor bathrooms so they are state of the art in terms of accessibility. If you've spent much time in the OT building, you know what big accomplishments new bathrooms are. Our two outreach centers, the Assistive Technology Resource Center and the Center for Community Partnerships, continue to provide excellent services to the CSU and Fort Collins communities. ATRC is instrumental in increasing accessibility of CSU's websites, course materials, and signage. With a Ventures grant, they produced and distributed nationwide seven videos highlighting the importance of accessibility on university campuses. Through a major donor, the Center for Community Partnerships created an amazing space where veterans and CSU students with disabilities can regroup and ward off stress. We have a lot to celebrate. And then COVID arrived. I think I speak for our whole faculty and staff and likely for many of you when I say that this past year was like unlike any that we've ever experienced. We learned a lot and experienced a lot. Some of it amazing, some of it terrifying and horrible. Despite it all, we grew and we will continue to grow. Here are some things that we're thinking about for the next five years. A part of my five year reappointment as a part of my five-year reappointment, I gave a magic wand to each faculty, staff member, and center director, hoping that the wands would help us create an amazing future. The wands came with one caveat. They only work when all of us is holding them, all of us that are holding them agree on the future that we envision together. And that is what I wish for each of you to join with family, friends, and colleagues to learn from the good, the bad, and the ugly of the last year, and despite, or perhaps because of it, to create an amazing future. Today, we take time out from our everyday work to learn, reflect, and share. Fair warning, when today's knowledge exchange is over, 
I'm going to ask you to identify one thing that you will take away and apply on Monday morning. One new thing that you wish for. To get us started on that journey, I'm honored to introduce our 19th Knowledge Exchange keynote speaker. Dr. Antoine Valliard is Associate Professor of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he also received his PhD. Dr. Valliard's clinical work has been in inpatient psychiatric settings where his focus is on enhancing quality of life, community integration, and participation with adults with mental illness. He also has worked with children and, and in community-based health settings with migrant groups and other marginalized populations. In his research, Dr. Balliard uses a participatory approach to study relationships among sensory experiences, mental health, and participation in meaningful activity. He is engaged in multiple projects providing outreach and supports to adults with serious mental illness who are homeless or at risk of being homeless in North Carolina and Los Angeles. Dr. Balliard's keynote address is entitled From Neuroscience to Meaningful Participation, a Sensory Perspective on Mental Health and Wellbeing. I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Antoine Balliard. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, the introduction. It is a tremendous, tremendous honor to be invited uh, to uh, to participate in your knowledge exchange. I will. Um, my objective today is really to, uh, to to shake up your understanding of sensory processing and to kind of to demedicalize it and maybe situate it a little bit more in the lived experience of meaningful doing. And uh, to do that, what I'm gonna I'll first start with reviewing some, some recent findings in neuroscience that describe the atypical uh, uh, sensory uh, processing patterns of adults with serious mental illness and their associated functional implications. I'll review some research on auditory visual systems and, uh, and some of the other systems that have come across as well. We'll discuss interoception and uh, predictor neurons and then uh, conclude that uh, section of the talk with uh, a, a quick discussion on interventions that specifically target sensory processing both in OT and outside of OT. And then I will introduce you to three separate studies that I have recently done on uh, occupation and sensory processing. And I will make a, a, a comment on um, uh, sensory processing, neurodiversity and justice. And then we'll end with a summary of all the implications for intervention. I will be giving you implications for intervention after each one of the studies I present, uh, but uh, there will be a summary at the end as well. So thank you. But before I start, I need to discuss the rates of mental illness. And uh, for those of you who attended the talk last night, you'll recognize this slide, but it's essential to continue here. Uh, the situation is dire. The numbers are going up. Uh, adults with any mental illness, the, their percentage uh, between 2008 and 2019 went up 3%, um, which is approximately 12 million people. That is a lot of people. Uh, this was primarily driven by young adults with any mental illness who uh, went up 11% during that same period, approximately 4 uh, million people. Now, when we talked about serious mental illness, we're talking about uh, forms of mental illness that significantly impact a person's ability to uh, function and interact with their environment. Uh, so adults with serious mental illness, the rates went up 2.5% something to the extent of 5 million people. Again, this was primarily driven by young adults with serious mental illness whose percentage went up 5%, accounting 1.7 million of that 5 million. So we need to act and we need to act now. If you look at these numbers, this means that people with a uh, mental illness, there's approximately one in five uh, uh, people in the US population. So this is not an issue to, um, to ignore and it should be a primary focus of, of our healthcare. So in the recent couple decades, there has been an explosion of neuroimaging due to amazing advances in technology. And this has really uh, enhanced our understanding of sensory processing at a neural level. So I'm gonna go re review these really quick with you. Uh, we can see things in the brain that we, we couldn't even imagine 20 years ago. So this has really advanced our understanding. For adults with serious mental illness, we have unequivocally proven with neuroscience, and I say we, you know, in the general we, uh, in, uh, as in uh, science has proven this, that there are atypical uh, sensory process, auditory processing deficits, particularly in sensory gating and mismatch negativity. So we have this brain wave called the P50 wave that when you hear a sound the first time, so let's take a, I'm gonna take my coffee mug here and start tapping it with my pen. And the first time you hear that sound, you get a brain wave that shoots up. But the second time you hear that sound, 
that brainwave decreases by 80 to 90 percent. And what this does is it allows you to hear the sound first and then reorient yourself to the rest of auditory stimuli so you can stay focused and uh, on what is important. You're able to habituate to that form, uh, that sound. However, people with SMI we have found tend to experience only a 10 to 20 percent reduction uh, of the um the uh, p50 wave which means that every time this sound keeps going they are hearing uh very close to uh the same uh brain wave as the first uh, time that the sound came so basically what it means is people have a very hard time filling uh, filtering out extraneous information and uh, especially in busy auditory environments now uh, research has also shown in neuroscience using neural imaging that uh, people with uh, SMI have uh, difficulties with mismatch negativity. And this is about recognizing uh, an acoustic irregularity in, within a predictable pattern of stimuli. What this means is that if you have a constant humming, for instance, and then that humming changes, that people with SMI tend to miss that change. Uh, in the next slide, I'll discuss some of the functional implications of these um, these issues. But essentially, both of these uh, uh, these issues with auditory pro processing make it difficult to filter out uh, extraneous information and also make it uh, difficult to um, to notice new information as it comes up. So when we look at sensory processing in general and social participation, those two auditory processing issues I mentioned earlier really manifest themselves in social cognition. We know that uh, people with the P50 uh, sensory gating uh, deficit, again, have difficulty processing competing stimuli. So when they're in loud auditory environments, when there's social environments and a lot of people talking, that it's really hard to focus on one conversation over the other. And this affects a person's social cognition, which is their ability to understand social processes. The mismatch negativity uh, that I mentioned in the last slide, well, that affects a person's ability, uh, effective, uh, their, their skills in effective prosody, which is really just reading tone or detecting emotion in a person's words. This translates to, you know, difficulty uh, understanding uh, people's theory of mind, difficulty having empathy for other people, um, and also difficulty in perceiving sarcasm. So you can imagine how a person with uh, of significant auditory processing issues in a social situation, uh, which is busy and people are joking around, uh, sarcasm is, is, is happening, that it's actually a very difficult situation for that person to participate in. More general research in occupational therapy using the sensory profile has revealed that adults with PTSD have difficulty forming intimate relationships because of their atypical sensory processing. We've also found that uh, people who have high scores on low registration on the sensory profile, which is uh, uh, um, basically they are not registering their sensory environments in the same way that is typical, that that is associated with aggression. People who have high scores on avoiding sensory uh, stimuli in their environments, and that's associated with anger suppression. So the auditory deficits are the ones that have been the most commonly explored and that are easiest to explore in terms of uh, neuroscience and other forms of, um, uh, of testing. But there are, we have found uh, other types of atypical uh, sensory processing in visual systems and other systems. Visually, uh, folks with uh, serious mental illness have been found to have difficulty with contrast, you know, just telling the difference uh, between background and foreground in terms of colors. They have difficulty tracking slow moving objects and experience saccades, which means when an object is moving like this, their eyes catch up, but then stop and then they need to catch up. So that saccadic movement is that eye tracking. Evidence shows that there's difficulty in maintaining a steady gaze, just focusing on one item or one uh, thing in the um, in, in the environment. There's also a diminished, diminished neural response to low frequency targets and also atypical scanning during free scan tests where you present somebody with an image and people tend to have uh, uh, um, the general population tends to have a, uh, a strategy for scanning images and that this is not reflected in the population with SMI. In terms of reading comprehension, the atypical visual processing has demonstrated that people with SMI um, have difficulty reading paragraphs from real world environments. So they're, they're have demonstrated proficiency generally in, in, in understanding single words, but once you start uh, presenting a person with uh, a, a lot of text, paragraphs, particularly those that are um, that are not well structured visually and it's just kind of a stream of, of, of writing, that those are very difficult for people to discern. The difficulties with contrast really affect a person's ability to discern nuanced information during complex tasks. In terms of olfactory and proprioceptive uh, sensory processing, 
Research has shown that people with serious mental illness have difficulty with smell identification and interpreting smells. So you can imagine how su such things might affect a person's ability to work in, in, uh, in, uh, in restaurants or uh, kitchens. That uh, people with, uh, with uh, SMI also have uh, issues with proprioception, which are associated with uh, disorders of self-awareness. When we look at just general sensory processing patterns using the sensory profile, uh, in occupational therapy, research has shown that adults with OCD have demonstrated that you know, there are higher scores in lower registration, sensory sensitivity, and sensation avoiding, uh, and then lower scores in sensation seeking. Adults with schizophrenia demonstrate a very similar profile with low, uh, high scores in low registration, sensory sensitivity, and sensation avoiding. But where they tend to be different is that the larger effect size was demonstrated with high scores of low registration. So this group is really, um, uh, uh, because of the, uh, the auditory processing issues, is having a really hard time detecting information in the environment auditorially. Adults with bipolar disorder, the evidence is actually pretty uh, inconclusive at this stage. We have one study showing that they have higher scores in low registration, sensory sensitivity, and sensation avoiding, and then another study that shows no difference in low registration. So the jury is still out. But we do know that there are some atypical sensory processing issues and that they do affect participation. So regardless of their actual, um, uh, the, the, the pattern in a, in a, a population sense, it is important to make sure that you focus on each individual and their own um, their own context. We know that adults with major depressive order also display um, uh, atypical sensory processing. They have high scores on sensory sensitivity and lower scores on sensation seeking. Now, recently there has been an even greater explosion on research on interoception. And interoception is your ability to monitor your internal bodily state, your hunger, temperature, your heart rate. And we've uh, recently been developing uh, uh, more uh, measures to measure uh, interoception in the, um, it used to be a heart counting task, but now uh, research has demonstrated that that is not as effective. And so now there are different types of assessments which are self-report. But interoception is much more than maintaining the homeostasis of your physiological steady state. Uh, research has showed that it also affects social cognition and, and a person's mental representation of their self, that it contributes to behavioral, cognitive, and effective regulation. So it's really a sensory capacity that we're only beginning to understand and uh, including its role in our everyday occupations. We do know that low interceptive ability is associated with uh, difficulty verbalizing feelings and difficulty reading, uh, I'm sorry, difficulty reducing the impact of emotions that result from negative experiences. But uh, if you look at studies, I recently saw a graph on the amount of studies on interoception and you know, it's just a steady graph. And then in the last two years, there's just a tremendous spike. Uh, people are studying this all across, including in an occupational therapy. So the studies that have looked at this with adults with serious mental illness uh, have, uh, have shown that SMI, people with SMI have atypical interoceptive sensitivity and that this is implicated in the onset of psychopathology, risky behavior in adolescence, decreased social emotional competence in late adulthood as well. Low interoception has been associated with uh, disordered eating. High interoception has been associated with anxiety disorders and uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's, it's almost like you really need to be in the middle of uh, your interoceptive ability. The reason that high interoceptive ability tends to be associated with anxiety in OCD is that the, uh, the, the, the mechanism that people are speculating is that the person is overly attuned or overly uh, uh, alert or aware of their internal bodily state. And then that is what contributes to the anxiety and the compulsive behaviors. But again, this is early evidence and a lot of more research needs to be done. We found that there's a strong positive relationship between the uh, between interoceptive accuracy and positive symptom severity in schizophrenia, which is very interesting as well. Now, what's really important though is that research is showing that these skills, like many other, are modifiable and affected by environmental circumstances. So we know that interventions can change a person's interoception skills, and we also know that parenting affects interoception. Studies have shown that attuned caregiving, basically recognizing and honoring a, a child's um, uh, bodily experiences, tends to result in better interoception in the future. Now, whether that leads to excessive interoceptive uh, skills, such that it is a precursor for anxiety and OCD, that also is something that needs to be studied. This is all very recent um, research. Now, the last uh, uh, um, sensory processing, atypical sensory processing uh, um, uh, tendency in SMI that I will cover is uh, sensory prediction. This capacity that we have 
to predict uh, sensory stimuli from uh, self-generated actions. So let me describe this very uh, ba in a very basic manner, because I know these uh, graphs and the figures can be pretty overwhelming. But essentially, when you initiate a motor command, your motor system sends an efferent copy to the sensory cortex, which then generates a correlated discharge, which is a prediction of the sensory consequences of your self-initiated motor command. So this has been studied where people press a button and then we're measuring their, um, their neural activity. So as the person presses that button, the brain basically predicts what sound will be uh, created by pressing that button. And then in typical individuals, we have a, uh, a natural um, uh, suppression of that uh, uh, of that uh, feedback when it, uh, I'm sorry, the sensory feedback when it comes back. So you see in the figure B here that healthy controls, uh, the red line there is what the prediction is. So when the person is reaching over to press the button, they have that amplitude that uh, goes up. And then when they actually hear the sensory feedback, that there's uh, in, that there's suppression of that so that the person knows that this sound they heard was generated by themselves. So this self-suppression of N, the N1 um, brainwave is actually very critical for understanding when you are doing something with your environment. So we know that people with schizophrenia and other uh, uh, serious mental illnesses actually have errors in prediction, self, uh, errors in predicting self-generated incoming sensory information. Uh, you can see in these amplitudes over here that actually they, there's uh, the amplitudes are very similar. So there's difficulty in predicting the consequences of actions. And this translates to a tendency to attribute the cause of an external sensory event to oneself. Now, if you think about that, that's really interesting in terms of a uh, person's delusions and hallucinations in terms of grandiosity and their ability to control their environment. There's also a tendency to depend on signs and visual indicators because of this inaccurate feedback from the uh, the environment that people are more dependent on uh, other visual aspects of the environment to understand uh, their sensory prediction. And on top of all this, we know that sensory processing affects cognition. So in addition to their obvious impact on functioning and doing meaningful activities, it contributes to cognitive difficulties, which can then also be a par uh, barrier to participation. Uh, research has demonstrated that uh, that people have difficulty concentrating, managing their emotions, and managing themselves in environments with intense stimuli. But again, uh, this translates to potential interventions where we know, or at least research has shown, that sensory processing interventions can improve cognition itself. So they're thereby reducing their uh, their impact as a barrier to cognitive processes. So there's more and more research supporting this bottom up approach, and um, it's not uh, just coming out of OT. It's coming. This is coming out of psychiatry and psychology. In terms of interventions, studies suggest that complex neurosensory processes can be modified through non-pharmacological intervention because of neuroplasticity. But again, more research is needed. So here are a few studies that are uh, that discuss this issue. Uh, uh, some studies have shown that intensive auditory training with computers can actually uh, improve cognitive verbal processes. Uh, in a, a very interesting case study, somebody uh, with bipolar disorder was given uh, uh, blue light blocking glasses, and that was associated with a rapid improvement in symptoms and, and including sleep hygiene. We know that blue light that emanates from all of our electronic devices can have an impact on sleep hygiene, and this study definitely proves that. We also know that cognitive training uh, uh, focused on sensory processing, so actually basically engaging cognitive behavioral training, uh, uh, focusing on your experiences of sensory can actually lead to normalization of auditory sensory gating processes. So that would suggest that you, a person is able to manage their social environment more effectively uh, with this kind of CBT approach. In occupational therapy, there are plenty of interventions in uh, sensory based interventions. And here I'm really focusing on uh, interventions with people with serious mental illness. We know that, you know, uh, uh, research in, um, in autism has generated significant and important work and that there's been a, a lot of progression there. But in, in the area of mental health, this the development has been much slower. So research is scant and it is needed. Um, especially since in my personal experience, uh, sensory based interventions are extremely common in inpatient psychiatry and community uh, mental health, yet there's the evidence backing those interventions is lacking. And that's very problematic because we don't want people just, you know, making up things as they go solely based on theory. It needs to be evidence based as well. 
So in OT, there are plenty of studies uh, proving uh, the efficacy of sensory rooms in hospitals to reduce uh, seclusion and restraint and improve emotional regulation. This is also an area that nursing has spent a lot of time in, so I'm not uh, sure that it's necessarily unique to occupational therapy, but occupational therapy is absolutely involved in this area of research. There's been also some interesting research that adapts a, uh, that adopts a more sensory integration approach, uh, um, like with this one with the, the SLP program, the sensory learning program with children with PTSD, where essentially the, the child was exposed to auditory, visual and vestibular stimuli, uh, and it was associated to improvement of symptoms and, um, and uh, better self-image, impulse regulation and affect regulation. That intervention was very interesting because the person lays down on a, a motion table, a trochoidal mo motion table, which basically provides vestibular input. And as this is happening, the child watches changing lights and listening to music. So it's it's a uh, it's more of a uh, sensory integrative approach than perhaps some of these other ones that we see, which are more sensory modulation programs. So here in this vein of research, we're, we uh, we have people uh, working on developing strategies for managing sensory arousal. So it's less about reorganizing the sensory system, but more about giving people strategies for managing their sensory system. So we uh, things like the sensory diet have come uh, about where you're trying to manage your level of sensory arousal and input throughout the day to maintain a steady state. Uh, there's been plenty of research on sensory kits and providing people with um, different forms of uh, like kits with different forms of sensory input to sort of regulate a person's level of arousal in the moment. Preliminary findings indicate a positive impact on emotional distress, but again, much more research is needed. And certainly there is a gap in research, right? Um, I mentioned this last night as well, but the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, which is a key driver in uh, mental health research, is mostly funding basic science research. Between 2003 and 2019, there was a 90% reduction in treatment trials for uh, people with SMI. There's definitely an overemphasis on neuroscience. Now, I'm not suggesting that neuroscience is not important, absolutely, but not to the extent at which it has prevented research on treatment because we can't just leave people hanging. So there's really in insufficient information on the functional impacts of atypical sensory processing and therefore less information on how to um, to address those functional impacts. And because of this gap of in research uh, in mainstream research, OK, so not just uh, occupational therapy, but generally there's been a tendency to conceptualize sensory processing as a contextual, a historical, passive, singular and reductionistic. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain later why that's problematic. And this is evidenced by NMIH's focus on basic neuroscience in controlled environments that they themselves are a contextual. In fact, some researchers highly criticize this type of research, arguing that it only captures artificial processes that are not at all reflective of, the, of our complex engagement in the real world, which makes a lot of sense. If you really narrow your studies on one singular aspect of sensory experience in a artificial environment, that does little to mimic what the real world is like. With, it's literally an assault of, of sensory information. In my humble opinion, it seems like this type of research is important, narrow included, but it, it is clear that we need to expand research on lived experiences. So uh, only a few studies have explored such experiences, and I'm now focused on one study from Landon and all in 2016, uh, which is really uh, powerful in demonstrating how noise sensitivity uh, affects uh, adults with schizophrenia. I'm going to read you some quotes because their words are far more revealing and impactful than what I could um, express. So participants reported, you know, everyone as students feel they should go to parties. And I went there basically because I had to, and it was hell on wheels when I did because of that auditory sensitivity. The sound coming from different places at the same time, I couldn't say that's that sound, that's that sound and shut one off, you know, like normal people, I guess, must just shut them off and choose that what they want to listen to. But I couldn't do that. They were all at the same time. So imagine two conversations, you can't, they, they go like that and you, you can't understand what's going on. I find it very hard to, to go in the city because of all the lights and the trucks and the air conditioning and uh, air conditioning vents and the fire engines and, and the, the noise. It's quite a challenge for me. I avoid parties. I avoid dances. I isolate a lot. And that isolation, they have groups that I could go to, but I stopped going to them. Yeah, so I actually avoid groups and churches are too loud. Church music too loud. Everything is just too loud. You can recognize noise sensitive people in that environment because they gravitate towards the outside of the group. You can see that such a thing is a considerable social disability. You see here by these lists of quotes that people are not able to participate and they're, they're feeling excluded, not feeling included. And it, you know, 
it's also an issue of justice. People were marginalized and alienated. Uh, I was berated because I couldn't hear heart sounds with a stethoscope. Now, it's not that I can't hear it. I have got very acute hearing, but I was hearing everything else and I couldn't sort out anything. And then I didn't even know it was mentionable. I thought it was just another thing. I had to shut up and listen to all the crap about. It bothers other people. They don't understand. They think you're a wimp or something like that. And then they didn't explain it to me, which I now understand it's a part of, hey, Ann, it's a part of your illness. It's okay. And that was part of my insanity, that this girl was going around with her earmuffs on and there were no loud noises at all, you know, and, and I could see, feel that I am mad. And that's psychosis to them. And anecdotally, from my personal experiences, I've seen this. I remember giving a training where I was talking about these uh, sensory issues and a peer support specialist came up, which is a person with lived mental experience, uh, lived experience with mental illness, who is now providing services to folks with serious mental illness. And she explained how she was in her office and uh, kept hearing the dings from her uh, coworkers' phones and all these notifications and she couldn't tune it out. And she it was very distressing to her. And she would ask her coworkers to turn off their notifications and they just, you know, kind of, uh, ignored her request and thought she was being, you know, uh, very um, uh, childlike. And uh, they basically made her feel like she didn't belong and she had to keep working in an environment with all those sounds. And that was a very alienating experience for her. These things are common. So now I would just like to talk about a couple of my own studies, which I think uh, can add on to Landon and all's uh, exceptional study. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, talk about one uh, in 2015 that I published in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy and uh, where I discussed habits of sensing and mental health, um, understanding sensory dissonance. And here, this study kind of came out of my dissertation research as well. Uh, I did similar research in my dissertation, but this was really deepening uh, an aspect of it where um, my participants in my dissertation research had mentioned these disconnected sensory experiences and it was very unclear so this study really focused on that so the aim was to explore the relationship between sensory features and latino immigrants physical environments and their dis uh, disconnected sensory experiences and to understand and understand the impact of their cultural attitudes and experiences on their perceptions of sensory experiences during typical adls i did walking with video which is a really cool method where you follow people with an, a camera as they engage in a meaningful occupation and and they reflect on the occupations. It gives you really rich contextual data. And then we also did semi-structured interviews to give more of that reflective process on the, um, the experience. The, the study was really interesting. Uh, one of the most significant themes was this idea of habits of sensing where participants described how they had incorporated these habits of sensing and were no longer able to rely on their habits in uh, bec um, in this new environment. So self-care was difficult. People were complaining that uh, they, uh, because of the different water consistency, that their hair would feel different and that they couldn't comb it like they used to and that this was a distressing uh, fact. That food was so different despite using the same ingredients and recipes, that it tasted like plastic, it didn't have any flavor. Uh, people said that, yeah, the Mexican food has its own flavor. It's a U.S. flavor. Um, and that it was really an alienating thing for people. They felt estranged uh, being in a faraway place, eating things that were supposedly like their country of origin, but they were different. And it actually made them miss home more. Uh, uh, and so, you know, it, it really causes these feelings of, of sadness and, and, and emptiness. So, you know, those were just very quick examples of how sensory uh, sensation is historical, that our occupational history, our engagement in meaningful uh, occupations affects our subsequent somatic attention, what we orient ourselves to in new envir envir environments. The participants in this study were no longer able to rely on these habits of sensing, these habits of somatic attention. So they experienced what we called sensory dissonance. dissonance. It interrupted the flow of their occupation, the habitual flow of their occupation, and they needed to recruit their conscious attention to focus on what was different. Um, and that was associated with feelings in alienation, nostalgia, and distress. Um, everyone was talking about, you know, everything was different. I had to shut myself away. Uh, I had to isolate myself, and that was depressing. People talked about having to unlearn things and relearn them and adapting themselves to their new environments. And this was associated with feelings of hopelessness, despair, and exasperation. When describing their habits of sensing, participants also described the existence of sensory anchors. And these are environmental stimuli that guide routine occupations. They operate below your conscious awareness and they're indicators that everything is going as planned. And they have been embodied as expected sensory stimuli um, associated with past uh, engagement in specific actions and occupations. So then the mismatch between available sensory anchors in the environment and a person's sensory habits in the moment is what created this feeling of sensory dissonance. So then the, the experience just feels wrong. People can't always put their finger on it, but it feels wrong. And it certainly disrupts the flow of, uh, of action requiring your attention. 
It was also found uh, that uh, sensory anchors are aesthetic, meaning that they were associated with judgments of what something should feel like, not like what it, um, an objective sense of what everybody should feel like, but a personal sense of what it sh should feel like. People would say, like, I don't like this type of smell because I use Clorox, but here it smells different. It, it doesn't seem like it cleans as well because it doesn't smell as clean. But that there's no objective way of telling. She didn't have an objective way of telling that the thing was that that, um, that products were less clean because of this. It was just the smell was different, that there was an association that this could no longer be clean. It just, it wasn't as strong, so it couldn't work as well. Uh, people reported how lettuce here just tastes dirty because of different agricultural practices in Mexico. Uh, there are these products where you have to wash your lettuce with sort of a bleachy type of product, and then your lettuce actually ends up having a bleachy type of flavor um, in uh, in certain areas in, in, in Mexico. And not having that sort of bleach, a very hint bleach flavor uh, on your lettuce here in the United States because our agricultural practices don't require that kind of product made people feel like it tasted dirty so they just didn't like the food even though it was perfectly fine to eat. I thought that was really interesting that someone would be seeking uh, that kind of bleachy flavor in their lettuce because to me that would be of uh, an experience of sensory dissonance and I would not enjoy that salad or however they were eating their lettuce. Uh, people were reflecting on how their cooking sprays they had never used cooking sprays before and that it, it, the only spray that they were associated with were like was hairspray and they just felt like a chemical and like they were spraying their food with with some kind of uh, aversive chemical and that made them feel bad. And then other people uh, reflected on things like smells that reminded uh, them of when they arrived uh, and, and that every time they encounter that smell again, it made them feel nostalgic and reminded them that they were far away. So here's a model right here, a visual model describing the relationship between sensory anchors, habits of sensing, and sensory distance. If you start at the left, you the person comes into uh, any situation with existing habits of sensing. They encounter sensory anchors in the environment. If you look at the middle line, if it's congruent with expectations, the action proceeds out of a habit and the person's not even aware. If you look at the bottom, if it's incongruent with their sensory habits, then they experience sensory dissonance, which requires an undesired adjustment to occupational formants, and that's associated with negative health. And what's interesting, and I will discover uh, discuss this right now, is some people were actually intentionally harnessing their an sensory anchors to engage in sensory scaffolding, which was a desired adjustment to their performance, which led to positive mental health. And so sensory scaffolding, this idea of harnessing sensory anchors, uh, the participants were talking about uh, uh, co having cognitive association that transcended the objective conditions uh, of their situation. For example, auditorially, uh, participants were talking about listening to church sermons from home, not because of the content, but because of listening to their voices and hearing it. They could imagine themselves there and actually be there with the person. So they were harnessing that sensory auditory stimulus. Uh, other participants were, were relating to music and playing a little music that was specifically from the region in Mexico, and they would imagine themselves there and that that would transport them out of their situation. One person even reported how when uh, she was listening to construction next door that she could close her eyes and imagine that she was at home with her and her dad was working on the patio and that she felt like she was at home and her father was outside and that this was very comforting, even though she knew that that was not the case. In terms of olfactory, people did the same thing. One uh, participant reflected that while she was running and she would smell food, she would tell herself, oh, delicious, they're cooking, a, oh, I don't know, a carne asada, but I'm making it up, I'm imagining it, and that's how it smells to me. Maybe because I want it to, but it's probably something else. Other people talked about restricting their their uh, their food to things like chicken because, well, it reminded themselves of home because of the smell. Um, and then certainly visually, uh, people were talking about how it, uh, it connected them, uh, uh, having colors in their home. Like this this particular example here, the uh, this participant was living in an apartment and could not color uh, paint his walls because of uh, the requirements of the, uh, the apartment complex. And so just having white walls to him just made him feel flat and he was not connected uh, with it all. And he also talked about using pictures to um, to uh, to associate with uh, with his past. So implications for intervention here. Well, habits of sensing exist and they vary among individuals. People have different sensory orientations to the environment. Sensory experiences can induce positive and negative mental states in typical healthy adults. So client centered therapy, therapy should be attuned to people's sensory preferences and aversions, regardless if there's a sensory issue there. And in that a person's uh, occupational history is related to their sensory history. So this means that sensory environments of intervention settings really matter. So we should be really focusing on removing uh, stimuli that cause unnecessary barriers and recognize that those are individual. And then think about how our own preferences that we bring to our environments 
could be barriers to others. The, if we're playing music, we like smells or insects and stuff like that, that could actually be a negative experience for someone else. And then it also suggests, you know, the difference between in-home versus clinic-based interventions, right? Um, when, when you're uh, thinking about doing intervention, there's a the difference between the presence and absence of different sensory anchors depending on when you're doing your intervention. Finally, this idea of sensory scaffolding, you know, the strategic use of sensory stimuli to appeal uh, to clients' sensory habits. You can harness these anchors. You could develop anchors through, uh, through uh, habit training. The idea is that you want to minimize sensory dis dissonance and you want to use these anchors to sustain habitual processes during interventions. The next study that I just wrapped up is currently under view in AJOT, and I hope no one in the audience is one of the reviewers because I may have just made a mistake, but uh, here we go. It's currently there. Um, this was about the lived sensory experiences of adults with psychotic disorders, and here we were exploring the relationship between atypical sensory processing patterns and participation in meaningful activities. To measure the, uh, the relationship, uh, we gave the sensory profile, the participant objective, participation subjective assessment, which is about um, engagement in meaningful activity, the positive and negative syndromes scale to control for negative symptoms and participation, and then the brief psychiatric rating scale to control for symptomology. And then the uh, second aim was uh, to explore how people relate their lived experiences to their participation, their lived sensory experiences. And here we uh, gave people, um, we engaged in photo elicitation where people were given cameras, went out and took pictures of situations where sensory uh, experiences really impacted their participation. We also did walking with video where we followed a person uh, with uh, a camera engaging in their occupation of choice, reflecting on their sensory uh, experiences, and then did what we called video elicitation. So basically, we took all these uh, video, this uh, visual data, met with uh, the person, presented the pictures, presented the video, and we discussed all of it together, and then added some additional questions at the end to do um, some interviews. Really interesting study. Unfortunately, COVID-19, made us have to stop and because of that we did not have enough quantitative data for inferential statistics so they're primarily uh, uh, descriptive at this stage but we did have enough data with the intensive qualitative stuff to really have some meaningful findings here so our first major finding was this idea of polysensory reality. This is not rocket science, this is something that should be really uh, logical to all of us, but we tend to not think of things in this way when we're doing treatment. So sensory stimuli were never experienced in isolation, right? Uh, even though we were asking for specific uh, people to identify specific stimuli, it was always described along with additional stimuli, which affected the actual meaning of the original stimulus. People would describe when they were describing, you know, washing their hands, they wouldn't just talk about feeling good on the, the hand, they would talk about the smells that came with it and the visual piece. Uh, this next quote I think is very interesting too. A person describing how much they liked a new church that has that incense smell, you know? So you get the new wood smell with the incense, but I don't like old churches that have that, like old Catholic churches that are burning incense because you can smell the musts and I don't like that. So the new church with the new wood, I like that smell. The experiences of sensations were contingent on the situation in which they were experienced, which is intuitive. Again, think about it. If you hear a loud noise when you're in a dark alley as opposed to in a bright room, how different that experience is to you. And this was reflected by uh, participants. Listening to music, live music is fine, but canned music, like music that's on the radio or something, it bothers me. It makes me, especially in the car, I feel more car sick when I listen to music. Sometimes it's okay, but it's just like, like this drone and especially repetitive songs that are on the radio all the time. It's kind of repulsive, but also kind of, I don't know, if I shower for, if I shower for a week and you get that, I uh, don't shower for a week and you, and you get that body odor, it's kind of nice. Like you're, if you're at work, you're embarrassed. And I'm like, this is awful. I'm turning people away and I'm very self-conscious. But if I'm at home, I'm like, mm, that smells kind of good. Um, right there, that really demonstrates the, 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 the contextual piece of it. This study also confirmed the existence and importance of sensory anchors and habits of sensing. Uh, many of sensory preferences were based in habits. This gentleman right here was talking about how much he loved Pine Sol because of this commercial back in the 90s where uh, an older woman uh, was sniffing the Pine Sol and was like, oh, this is so good. So he liked Pine Sol and he likes the, the scent it leaves now. Um, Sensory anchors, again, these are the cues that are monitored subconsciously to, uh, to ensure an ex activity is proceeding as expected. A person, uh, when reflecting on walking on the treadmill, he said, I'd like to hear myself to make sure I'm not walking on the wrong part of the treadmill. It helps me with where I put my feet so I can focus more on the walk and the music. And then 
uh, it also concern, uh, confirmed this existence of aesthetics, embodied aesthetics of everyday life. So one of our participants uh, during the walking with video, he wanted to make a hamburger and he used sliced bread to make it. It's perfectly fine. But when we started talking about why he was using sliced bread, he reflected that it was actually a preference of his and he would rather use that than a bun. And he explained it this way. So they, referring to as my parents, they're from the South Bronx, so they know how to take things and make do with what they have. I'm not saying I'm struggling now, but I just got that from them. I guess it's just ingrained in me, I guess. It's just bread to me. So like he was literally tasting the frugality of his parents there, and that was the aesthetic of that moment. This one that I enjoyed too, where uh, you know past experiences definitely shaped how experiences should feel in the moment. When reflecting on his genes, uh, this person was saying, I'm very comforted. I feel better about myself when I put them on because they feel better. I, I just feel better when I have them. I, I get excited when they come out of the wash and I can wear them. There's other jeans that don't fit as well and I feel awful in. I, I don't feel as good about myself. I, I, it's like I just don't feel as comfortable, but these jeans just fit really well. I like the way they kind of worn out a bit. I've definitely had jeans like that in the past that I wore out myself and they were much, they had much more meaning. These kind of feel that way without actually being something I've had for years. I think it's some, I think some of it is the weight and the pressure on my legs where it fits on my body. Fascinating stuff, huh? And finally, uh, the last uh, major finding we had was that people were active sensory beings. They're not passive, like we tend to conceptualize. People just don't get stimuli. They actually orient themselves to stimuli. They seek things, uh, like drinking cold water. He was reflecting on how it's something pleasurable and that he's attached himself to it, so he seeks it out. Or uh, people who didn't like loud noise, they didn't just go out of the situation. They 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 stayed in the clubhouse to manage uh, because they needed to go there. So they were actively managing uh, their their sensory um, uh, uh, processing. And then uh, this last quote was about somebody who actually used auditory sounds to make himself feel comfortable. He would just make the same noise noise over and over again, and it was it was comforting to him. So in terms of implications for intervention, well, again, very similar to the uh, last time. Evaluating sensory processing patterns is important. We probably need to go beyond uh, a contextual standardized assessments to understand the lived polysensorial experience in real world context as a biological process that becomes meaningful and aesthetic through sociocultural experience. We know that sensations vary in meaning and impact on participation depending on the context. So it's important to o to avoid overgeneralizing the impact of a nauseous stimulus across a parent's uh, a, a, a client's various contexts. We probably need a structured observational guide uh, to improve assessment across real world contexts. Again, sensory anchors exist and can facilitate or impede performance so that habit training could be used to modify sensory anchors to support participation. Negative sensory experiences can lead to avoidance of health promoting occupations. So we don't want to avoid occupations that, in, uh, uh, that entail aversive sensory experiences. We really want to help people manage those sensory aversions so they can still participate in those health promoting occupations. And then it's just really important to understand this, a client's sociocultural background and the impact of sensory preferences. Again, to harness those aesthetic preferences to support participation. The last study I'm going to mention uh, of my own is uh, is targeting this explosion of an interoceptive ability. So I'm studying the uh, the relationship between interoceptive ability and occupational participation. Um, the question is exactly that. What is the relationship? Uh, we are um, measuring. Uh, so our first aim is to measure the relationship using uh, these assessment tools here. Again, the participation objective, participation subjective assessment for looking at uh, actual engagement, and then the multidimensional assessment of interoceptive awareness too. Um, and we are controlling for cognition here uh, using the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the MOCA. And then aim two, we want to explore again how people uh, relate their abilities to their interoceptive abilities to their participation. So we'll be doing semi-structured interviews uh, and collecting a daily diary uh, with folks to, re to reflect on their um, their daily experiences. Um, we'll be doing the, we're doing this in inpatient mental health at UNC hospitals. It's only with adults with serious mental illness. The quantitative assessment battery will be giving it to 75 people. The qualitative phase, however, we're going to stratify it across M Maya scores on interoceptive ability. We'll have three people with high scores, three people with average scores, and three people with low scores to then participate in that secondary uh, part of data collection. Um, we hope to use inferential uh, statistics on, uh, uh, on the analyses. So currently we've uh, had 10 people participate uh, and just uh, the, the only thing that's standing out now, so you know, take this with a grain of salt because it's so early, there's no statistical, statistical significance yet, but we're seeing that people are showing uh, higher scores so that the ratings are from zero to five, which zero is a value, never. So um, uh, 
so that basically 2.5 is really in the middle of interoceptive ability. And we're seeing that our population here so far with temperature since the averages are pretty high up um, in uh, in these areas right here. We don't know what it means yet, but we'll get there. So now I have to take a, a quick turn, a pivot. Uh, here, uh, since sensory processing patterns affect well-being and a person's ability to integrate with physical, social, and cultural environments, then it's also a matter of justice because it's a matter of inclusion, right? If we look at justice and neurodiversity, you know, we start thinking about things in this way. We can think about the idea that society tends to build environments that are suited to normative sensory processing of typical individuals. And there's a very good reason that uh, that uh, society evolved to, 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 to have that focus, but we know more now. And research is showing that this leads to a person with atypical sensory processing to feel unable to, to participate. It can cause occupational deprivation, feelings of exclusion, and poor community integration. So it's something that we need to attend to because we now know that people have these sensory processing issues and we are consciously building new uh, environments. We need to link that information together. This idea of neurodiversity, it's uh, you know, uh, it, it, it uh, confirms the fact that we we have different relationships with our physical and sociocultural environments, and that this leads to different ways of being and different ways of doing. Uh, so it, it, I think uh, you know it's important for us to start thinking about things in terms of accepting differences in neural functioning as normal, because they are they are natural occurrences and not as abnormal deficits and aberrations that need to be fixed. Even if you look at a bell curve in terms of sensory processing, those tail ends. They're normal in the fact that they exist in their natural occurrences, but that's not how we think of it. We take those two tails of the bell curve and we try to make sure that everyone fits in that middle. And that, that's just, that is uh, potentially uh, uh, an oppressive act. So, you know, neurodiversity is not necessarily a thing to cure. It's not. And research is showing that if you take this approach with people uh, with schizophrenia and you provide education uh, where they are more aware of their neurodiversity, that it can actually reduce negative emotions. I mean, think about how that peer support specialist I was mentioning earlier uh, and the other person, just knowing that that auditory processing is a part of your, your, your mental illness then makes you feel less crazy is what she, she described it as. So one of the leading contemporary theories of justice uh, is the, capa uh, the capabilities approach, and it cites the senses as one of the top 10 fundamental human capabilities that societies should support among their constituents. So here it's just this being able to use all of one's senses, being free to imagine to think and reason, having the education that enables this to be done in a civilized human way. Again, the awareness that I have a different sensory processing capacity and that it's OK. It's just part of who I am and that I'm able to use this in a civilized and human way. Having access to cultural experiences, literature, art and so on, and, and being able to produce one's own expressive work um, and having the freedom of expression, including political and religious. Because again, atypical sensory processing leads to difficulty in participating in environments built on normative sensory processing abilities. It obviously leads to different forms of occupational injustice. I'm not going to go through this entire list, but you can see here that there are different forms of social uh, exclusion and you can imagine how sensory uh, a person's sensory orientation can lead to their inability to participate in occupations uh, which uh, translate to this various forms of injustices that are socially created um, and not within the person again a lot of this has to do with that social model of disability right where we're we're taking the person we're looking at things uh, uh, broader we're not situating the problem here in the individual we're accepting that the person is who they are and that the problem is actually on the environment and not being able to accommodate the individual so tr stop trying to change people, change the environments. This is a message that I always give in my trainings. Uh, the medical model makes us focus on the person. Think of that PEO model, right? Uh, the medical model trains most people to focus on the P, the E, the P, the P, but that's actually the hardest part to change. Changing the environment, changing the occupation is often the, uh, the solution here. No, so like I mentioned earlier, normative sensory appro approaches to sensory processing can be oppressive if you're really trying to normalize a person. But this also makes us think like how impoverished environments, people who don't experience the same opportunities of embodiment, uh, maybe are not unable to develop their sensory capacities in the way, are unable to develop useful sensory habits that allow them to integrate in certain environments that are privileged and uh, allow you to achieve higher socioeconomic standing. So it, it's actually a, a, a part of OT, in my opinion, to advocate for sensory needs and, and neurodiversity. It's an invisible need for a lot of people. Again, remember that example of that peer support specialist I mentioned on the ACT team who was being marginalized and humiliated uh, with her coworkers because of her auditory sensitivity. 
and just learning that she had that auditory sensitivity and that it was a part of her mental illness completely changed her life, according to her. Um, so we really need to be focusing on adjusting these sensory environments to enhance inclusion, on honoring the history and embodiment of sensory experiences, and on incorporating sensory embodiment in learning and in therapy. So I'll just give you a couple of additional implications for intervention that um, because uh, I've given you some that are uh, based on my studies, but there are also some additional ones that are evident in the literature. And uh, from that landed in all study, which was a terrific study, uh, the adaptive strategies that were used by um, uh, his participants, well, people, for instance, when grocery shopping, were going either early in the morning or late at night to avoid crowds. All this stuff is pure OT, by the way. This makes perfect sense to, to the occupational therapist here, right? Uh, at work, well, again, it, it's about changing the environment instead of, you know, the person trying to change themselves or engaging in CBT uh, to normalize their auditory processes. How about just moving to a, a less noisy space? Those kinds of accommodations are, are very important. Uh, and, Research has shown that environmental modifications in workplace environments are the least common intervention in supported employment in mental illness. I should have included that citation there that was in my brain from a grant I just wrote, uh, but um, that's a major issue. We need to be modifying the environment. When people were uh, choosing a home, they were intentionally selecting uh, less noisy places. Uh, when there was background music in stores, people were, were actually going up to employees and asking them to lower the music, lower the volume. You have to have a lot of, uh, of, of self-efficacy to do that, but and that's the role of therapy is to help somebody make that accommodation. Now, a natural uh, uh, reaction when you're thinking about auditory sensitivity is to think about, oh, just put on some headphones, put, on, put in some earplugs, and that'll eliminate the noise. Well, not in this study. It didn't work. They said it was not satisfactory. They said first it brought unwanted attention and uh, and just looking strange. You know, why is this person wearing headphones and this person's not? They were uncomfortable and they just didn't work. The sounds were muffled. So the people still heard all the noises coming in and unable to uh, filter through it. They were just muffled. So it really did nothing. If anything, it was aversive. So maybe headphones and earplugs aren't the best intervention. My, my, when I hear that, I think if the person's able to listen to music at work, then maybe they can listen to music to drown out the other sounds. And that can be done in a way that is more socially acceptable. But we don't know if that would work in this case. Uh, participants also said that they needed to engage in a lot of relaxation after they had to rejuvenate, after coping all day, after an outing, they, they would rest themselves in a dark room with little stimuli to sort of just come back. Uh, and they would engage in calming activities, swimming underwater, praying, reading, and all those things contributed. So we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, that uh, atypical sensory processing is known to have an impact on cognitive functioning, such as concentrating, managing emotions, and managing oneself uh, uh, in environments with intense uh, stimuli. We also know that adults with serious mental illness also experience other life circumstances which affect their cognitive processes in addition to their sensory processing. Uh, you know, it tends to be a trait deficit of the illness. It's often a result of treatment. The medications can do this. It's often a result of accumulated disadvantage in a person's environment where they uh, were, you know, different pathways in education can affect your cognitive processing. And then a lot of times uh, people with serious mental illness have comorbid illnesses, which also affect cognition. And then we know, you know, over time it develops, you know, through aging, with lack of sleep, with lack of exercise, which are both things that people with serious mental illness uh, research has demonstrated that they're not sleeping well and that they're not exercising enough, so that also affects cognition. But we know in a good way that it can be developed through training and that strong cognitive skills can make learning easier. So uh, it's definitely something to uh, consider when you're um, when you're working with people. So putting all this stuff together, atypical sensory processing, barriers with cognitive processes, it's essential for you to consider how you present information in terms of verbal, written, and uh, demonstration. Um, you know, basically, uh, it's important to have communication strategies. And now I'm talking about working with people with serious mental illness, you know, to, to engage in these general communication strategies that are here. Now, before I list them, though, there's a big caveat to this. There's one thing about uh, speaking to a person uh, in a structured and, and uh, concrete and uh, very understandable way, which is very different than talking down to somebody using baby talk. Right. Any of you have worked in an inpatient setting who have seen uh, somebody come up to somebody who is perfectly uh, cognitively capable, but then engages that in sort of like baby talk and talking down to them as if they're a child. That is a very oppressive act. Uh, so be very mindful of those kinds of tones. But general things to consider, you want to make sure someone's focused and that their attention is there. Remember, there's a lot going on, a lot to filter out. 
give time for processing, pace yourself, be okay with uncomfortable silences. We tend to fill voids with words and that's not always a good thing. Uh, structure your information and conversations so that it's very clear and, and, and um, uh, using first then language. Use simple and concrete language, avoiding abstract concepts and metaphors, but again, don't engage in that baby talk. And of course, avoid the, uh, the distracting and completing, uh, competing stimuli. So other visual communication strategies, when you think about the auditory complexity and the visual issues, you probably want to write a lot down and you probably want these things to be very well structured. So you want to use large print, high contrast, short sentences. Remember how people are, are reading information, clearly separating information, using numbers to sequence information, pictures, and clearly labeling things. Now, recently we saw CDC guidelines come out and we had to try to adapt them for uh, all the folks we were working with. Um, I have the pleasure of working at the Center for Excellence in Community Mental Health, and we, you know, uh, we, by the way, just reported a major success on on, on, on um, giving vaccines to most of our uh, our clients, but we also had to adapt CDC guidelines at the beginning. And if you see on the left here, that's what was on the CDC website a while ago. I'm assuming it's still the same. And if you have uh, visual processing issues, difficulty reading, that the the uh, the sequence on the left is actually kind of a nightmare and it's very difficult to understand. And then you look at this, this different uh, aspect here on the right that uses numbers, actual pictures that are meaningful, not just like the random picture that you see on the left with the CDC thing, which is not at all informative, but the pictures on the right are actually guiding a, per a person through a sequence that is numbered with simple, concrete action uh, uh, verbs uh, is much more effective to communicate information to anybody with sensory or cognitive needs. All the OTs in the audience who work with autism spectrum uh, disorders are very attuned to this kind of thinking. Uh, anyone who has been trained in uh, um, uh, teaches approach, uh, T-E-A-C-C-H at the University of North Carolina, uh, their approach uh, will also implement these kind of cognitive structures for uh, adults with, and uh, children with uh, autism. Uh, and uh, it, the, the evidence is showing that it's also effective uh, with adults with serious mental illness. So. I realize I ran a little bit over and good news is we're at the end of the talk. I am just going to quickly summarize the major implications here. Um, so when you put all this together and some of this is re repetition, but that's OK. Uh, sensory preferences are not these objective things that we're just born with. They're actually historical and they're embodied that we have habits of sensing and that we expect sensory anchors in our environments and that they're critical to the everyday occupational performance. They vary across individuals and cultures, but also within individuals, they vary across contexts. That sensory experiences are polysensorial. Uh, the gestalt of a sensory experience is much more important than one objective uh, stimulus in a, a situation and that sensory processing patterns are just different modes of engaging with the world and the world is built according to normative sensory processing patterns so it is an issue of justice and inclusion and then finally in terms of interventions well we need to be assessing these patterns even when a person doesn't have a sensory processing issue we need to be thinking about uh, sensory based interventions in a client-centered way um, in a system and understanding their sensory needs and their sensory profile. We need to organize our environments to optimize the fit between the sensory environment and the person's sensory capacities. We need to adapt activities to minimize aversive sensory experiences and maximize preferred sensory experiences. And we definitely need to be assessing personal strategies in addition to offering other strategies that seem to be um, effective. And, you know, in the end, uh, we know that we need to adapt our communication, education and supports uh, to uh, be simpler with more visuals and uh, just much more concrete. And just one last point, because I realized I forgot to share one example that really drives home the sensory anchor example. Um, when uh, one of my students recently uh, shared this example uh, that, that she felt like uh, really expressed how sensory anchors affect her life. And so we're all aware that when we get behind the wheel, we drive. And we tend to, you know, get into that habit where, you know, you drive for a while and then you're you're you get lost in your thoughts and then all of a sudden you're, you're where you are and you're like, oh, my goodness, I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing. I was relying solely on habit. Right. Well, um, this student was driving on a regular pathway uh, as usual, got lost in thought and then all of a sudden was disoriented and she was like, where am I? Did I take a wrong turn? And she hadn't what she realized. It took her a minute to figure it out that she was still actually on the right path. But there was a, a big tree that used to always be there, and that was a sensory anchor for her. And for whatever reason, that tree was cut down between the, uh, her last trip and her new trip. And having missed that big tree, subconsciously, it told her, whoa, wait, that tree wasn't there. Something is wrong. Your anchor wasn't there. Your habits are no longer fitting the environment. And then she sprang forth into the moment 
and had to adjust her uh, participation in the moment. And I thought that was a really um, simple example that uh, that probably uh, uh, relates to a lot of uh, a lot of us in the audience. So that is it. I have a long list of references that I used for this, and I would like to thank you again for giving me this amazing opportunity to interact with you. I just wish I was there. Dr. Balliard, thank you so very much. Um, appreciate uh, your use of narrative stories to really help us see, understand, even feel, right? The huge connection there is between our sensory experiences and our participation in what's meaningful. So those in the audience, feel free to continue to post your questions and answers, and we will move into a time of sharing some of the audience's questions. So Anton, I'd like to begin uh, with a question that someone posed. I think it's a great thing for us to just kind of review is the idea of the interoception is kind of a new concept. And so can you talk a little bit more about that? Is it on a conscious level or a subconscious level? How does that sensory experience, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, I would say it's both, right? Um, again, we're learning a lot about this and it, it literally has exploded in the past couple of years, this research, but yeah, it's a, I would say it's a conscious and subconscious thing. Um, you know, the, the scale itself, the Maya scale that I presented earlier, uh, really demonstrates that from zero to five on how some people are, are, are not aware at all of these interoceptive sensory experiences or, and some are overly aware of them. So um, I think uh, it, it, just like many other things, uh, it goes in and out of consciousness and um, and that it uh, has a, 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 an impact on your on your on your everyday doing when you may not even realize it, right? So if you're, you know, if you're experiencing a higher heart rate or, you know, some high blood pressure, that these things, you're, you kind of feel them, but you're not necessarily always aware of them. And it's not always related to the, the, the moment of what you're doing, you know? So imagine right now, I imagine a lot of students are, are, are sort of a little bit higher stress level than usual. And uh, so they have this higher, a uh, sense of arousal in all moments and uh, may or may not be aware of that and how it's affecting their their mood. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer to it, but I think the, 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 the short answer is both, yes. Yes, and I think that's really helpful to kind of understand that even difference in awareness for people. So some will be very aware and at times some of us will be more aware than others. So I think that's, that's very helpful. So um, you had, uh, talked about um, sensory processing deficits in persons with SMI. Can you share or do you know any information about how those processing deficits remain or change when people are taking medications? So do we know anything oh, about the interaction between medication and sensory processing? And then, of course, ability to participate. Yeah, well, that's a great question, right? So medications, uh, at least the way people describe it, this is not from the research, but clinically, because, uh, you know, I, I used to work a lot in inpatient psychiatry. Clinically, what people report and in the community now currently is that it totally disrupts their sensory processing. Now, whether that's a permanent effect over time, that is something that should probably be studied, yeah. But people don't feel right when they're on their medications, which is often why they don't like to take their medications. Uh, it's very common for people to describe uh, their, their antipsychotics, especially first generation uh, antipsychotics, even more so, where uh, people would even feel like they're in their bodies. They would have these like just weird sensory experiences where um, everything was disrupted. And because of that, you know, if you think about it, you, you, you no longer feel like yourself. You no longer feel like you're in the moment. Why would you want to take that medication if it's going to make you feel worse? So the medications have done a great job about reducing positive symptoms. So those are, you know, the overt delusions, the overt hallucinations. Medications haven't done anything for resolving these sensory processing issues or the negative symptoms, which are both according to, the, or there's increasing evidence that both of those are actually more disruptive to a person's well-being than the positive symptoms. Mm. Very, very helpful there. And it, it leads to another question um, regarding any differences in sensory processing with 
positive versus negative symptoms with people with schizophrenia. So do we yeah. know anything about that? Well, there was one finding that came out. Uh, it was in the slide where um, uh, there was a, a high correlation that was found with um, high interoceptive ability was very much associated with the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, especially grandiosity. So where a person was so aware of their internal uh, state and if you couple that with the uh, sensory prediction errors that I mentioned er earlier, where a person wasn't necessarily able to distinguish between uh, what they were generating as opposed to what was coming from the outside, that you couple uh, those two facts, it would really, it really explains a lot on how this gra this uh, this grandiosity can come about. Um, so the the two are absolutely related. Yes. Excellent. And kind of a follow up on that question. Are there any known typical sensory patterns found in different cultural or racial populations based on even place or ancestry as you talked yeah. about? Well, so I think that's a, that's a great question because that shows the the person is is appreciating the um, the uh, the lived experience and the embodiment experience of, of sensory processing. So yeah, I mean, my studies, that's essentially what I found. It's um, that we do develop these habits that actually uh, are sensory habits. And a lot of them are, are very culturally based. Um, so when we're talking about different ethnicities, I think it's more about that cultural piece. You know, I think it's really about where you're growing up and what your experiences are and what you're literally incorporating, embodying sensory wise as expectations and experiences. So things you, you expect certain tastes. You know, I mean, it, a good way to explain it, like, you know, comfort food that everyone experiences. It's not because it's like really good objectively. No one's going to say it's high cuisine or whatever, but it's comfort food because you grew up and you had this embodied sensory experience where it literally became associated with comfort and home. And so that just shows you how your your, your sensory history then affects what your, your preferences are later in terms of sensory wise. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm French. I grew up um, uh, moving back and forth uh, between France. And so I love the French cheese there. And there's a particular cheese, Camembert, which, um, you know, is uh, you can't find it here uh, because uh, it's all pastoral here but over there it's unpasteurized and when uh, I would have my friends visit France with me they couldn't eat it they called it baby diaper cheese because it was so aggressive so intense of a sensory experience and I agree but for me like it drew me in a different way than it drew them um, and so that was like a cultural difference right there absolutely yeah and you know uh, we all experience that it makes me think of a friend who has uh, loves milk toast and that's a comfort food. And to me, that sounds horrible, right? <laughs> yep. So we each can think about all of our experiences that we have and our elements that have come with us. Yep. So this particular question is related to one of the research studies that you talked about today. In your research with Latinos and sensory dissonance, were the participants of Mexican descent, and I'll, I'll do one other and then I'll break it here. And did they come from other countries as well? So kind Absolutely. Of just, okay. They, they came from all over. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in North Carolina, where I did my studies, uh, we have, of course, I mean, you know, Mexicans tend to make up the, 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 the I think it's like 50% of the population. That number may have changed, but a long time ago, it was 50% of the Latino immigrant population. But uh, in my area, there, there are a lot of uh, people from Colombia, a ton of people from Colombia, but I also had people from Argentina, from Chile, uh, and um, a couple from uh, other countries in Central America. Um, and and you know, that's a very important question because I, I suspect that the person who asked that question understands that these are very different cultures and these are they even have different languages and that words actually mean different things depending on the country. Uh, and that can actually lead to a lot of confusion where people assume they have the same culture and the same language, but it's not true. And so actually there's a lot of conflict uh, in between uh, Latin Americans in that sense. So I would say that the um, the reason uh, why that was so powerful in my study is that it really revealed this ho whole historical piece of it, and and it wasn't tied to ethnicity. You're Latino, therefore you have this preference. It was tied to this is where I grew up. These were my experiences. That's why I have uh, these preferences. So it's not just because I'm a, I'm a Mexican. It's because I was Mexican in this area of Mexico, growing up with these practices that are unique to that area in Mexico that I have these experiences. Excellent. I think that's real helpful. The other the other half of the question, which I think you've really addressed is, you know, does it make a difference 
and I think you're saying it does, to differentiate country and region uh, as it relates to dissonance, that we're going to yeah. all experience that. Yes, but I, I would be careful uh, in uh, over um, generalizing similar experiences in countries or in even regions, right? Like, I mean, there's absolutely a, a, a sort of like a cultural sensory processing pattern that we probably share across culture, like in, in that one culture, but that you really need to, to understand that the, the unique uh, uh, meaningful experiences each individual has then sort of change those aspects as well. So everyone's different and just never assume that someone has a similar sensory preferences or aversions just because they're of a same similar origin as someone else that you know. Great, I think that's really helpful, right? You've talked about the hidden nature of some of this, which is true for all of us. In following up on your research, um, has your research shown any differences in tactile sensory processing in persons with SMI? And they go on to say, I'm thinking about those who may have experienced trauma mm -hmm. and how that may impact their participation especially for social and intimate relationships. Absolutely. So yeah, we have to talk about trauma when you talk about mental illness. And you also have to understand that trauma is um, more common than we realize and that it happens faster than we realize and that uh, it's likely that everyone you know has experienced some form of trauma at some point and that it really stuck with them. And it's always through this a very sensory way. So if you think about it, again, you engage in these activities and you embody them from a sensory perspective, and then you experience a very meaningful in a traumatic sense experience, and that you embody those sensory experiences in that moment, the research definitely shows that um, uh, people talk about aspects of that sensory experience being triggers. So if you experience something that reminds you of that, of that embodied traumatic experience, that it triggers the trauma again. So it's absolutely something that needs to be considered. Um, it, it, uh, it, it hasn't come up in my work uh, so much. Uh, it, were uh, the uh, tactile differences have come up? It, it have not been a result of like, um, uh, congenital sensory processing difference or even historical well I guess historical in a way it tend the people that I work with who tend to have tactile issues it's because of things like neuropathy it's because of things like their medications it's because of comorbid issues it hasn't been so much of uh, of um, uh, uh, from trauma as much but that also could be the, just because of the nature of my interactions with them I'm not necessarily engaging in those intimate uh, uh, relationships where you would have that tactile experience that could evoke the trauma so um, it just hasn't come up in my research as much but I do think it's absolutely relevant and important. Thank you Antoine. Um, in your presentation at uh, a point you shared you or you talked about the teach program oh, yeah. for uh, autism treatment. Can you just briefly share a reference for that or like go to this website for people? Yeah. We've got several people so, interested in that reference. Absolutely. So I'm very biased. The way I got into OT was working through Teach. And uh, I was a uh, before I was an OT, I, w I worked with children and, uh, and adults with uh, autism, which may have influenced my interest in sensory processing with a, uh, with a serious mental illness. But uh, I worked for Teach and supported employment. So look it up. It's part of the University of North Carolina. It's spelled T-E-A-C-C-H. And if you, I guarantee you, if you just do a random Google search, so put two C's in there and put UNC, you'll find all the resources. And, um, you know, they've done incredible work uh, uh, worldwide um, uh, and, and, and do a lot of local stuff as well. I mean, people actually move to this area to, to get teach services. Uh, and um, and uh, I highly recommend you look them up. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to shift directions a little bit here mm -hmm. um, to you've talked and given a couple of examples about work sites. So the question is that ADA does mandate that reasonable accommodations be given to workers with impairments. Uh, the person's reflecting, I could see how manufacturing positions, food industry positions would be difficult for people with sensory processing disorders. So what recommendations would you have related to this idea of completing a comprehensive sensory assessment? And should that be considered as a pre-employment? Um, so that's the first part of it. Second part then is how might we workplaces reasonably accommodate for the myriad of sensory patterns that people may have? 
Okay, so you just hit on two grants I just submitted. <laughs> awesome. First Tell one, uh, so Nidler, I just submitted a grant to Nidler about employment, and actually one of our um, our uh, uh, we have it's a you know there's a lot in this project. It's a very big project, five years, two point five million. But um, one of our aims is to develop a smartphone application for uh, providers of supported employment to be able to do this more nuanced type of um, assess assessment of a person's sensory needs and their sense and the sensory aspects of a workplace environment, so they can see where the fit is going uh, or where there's a lack of fit. And it would also uh, auto generate um, uh, suggestions on how to uh, to potentially uh, do accommodations to enhance the fit between the demands of this, uh, the workplace environment and the person's sensory needs. The truth is that most people are, uh, mental health providers are unaware that this is an issue or are completely unaware that the sensory processing is an aspect of mental illness. So there's a lot of education that needs to be happening here. And uh, that's part of what this intervention is all about, is to make this more mainstream and a part of uh, intervention. Because again, uh, if for those of you who heard my talk last night, the number one reason for job separation for adults with serious mental illness is actually job dissatisfaction. It's them who are voluntarily leaving because they don't like where they're working. And um, and it, it, with all this knowledge we know about sensory processing, it seems to me that that has to be an aspect of this. Particularly when you think about the way the system is structured, people with mental illness uh, who are having a hard time fi finding work and who are receiving employment services are going to be placed in jobs typically that are easy to find. And those jobs, well, I think you just named them, manufacturing, restaurants, all those jobs tend to have actually pretty aversive sensory environments. And those are the primary targets for, uh, for, for employment. So there's a lot of reworking that needs to be done here. And so now I'm going to touch on my second grant, which was with SAMHSA, which is actually a mental health awareness training grant. Um, where one of our, uh, our our aims is to develop a uh, mental health friendly business program where we're going to collaborate with men, uh, with businesses. We already have a bunch of them committed to, to, to work with us on this, where we will do trainings and develop goals and um, do OT interventions to enhance the mental health awareness of uh, businesses so that they can meet the needs of their employees and their clientele. And um, then they would get this like nice little badge that's a, a mental health friendly business badge and they would be able to uh, display that. It's it's sort of mirroring a, a, a similar effective approach um, uh, called the Dementia Friendly Business Program that uh, that, that worked very well. And, and so we're, we're just kind of mirroring that. Um, it was local to us as well. And so uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because by doing that kind of mental health awareness, training with those employers the idea is that we'll make them sensitive to these issues it will bring up things like ada and uh, then they will they will be much more receptive to making accommodations uh, than they would be without those uh, that, that training that awareness training i've got my fingers uh crossed for you for that <laughs> sounds like well, a wonderful <laughs> uh piece of work that will truly help uh get our environments to be more sensitive. So one of the concepts that has resonated with a lot of our uh, audience today is this idea of sensory anchors. Mm. And so first part of the question is, what is the origin of that term? And is it embedded in our profession of occupational therapy? It is not. Um... The origin of the term, I was giving a presentation at WFOT in Japan, presenting preliminary results from that study. And in the heat of the moment during uh, my presentation, I said, uh, yeah, these are like sensory anchors. They anchor you in the moment. <laughs> and somebody in the audience really jumped on that term. And I was like, yeah, I think that's actually, that's that's it. That's the uh, the concept. And then, uh, so it gave a term to uh, the, 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 um, uh, the concept that I had. I hadn't had labeled it yet. And it happened uh, there at WFOT. <laughs> and no, I, I, and to my knowledge, it's not been uh, taken up um, uh, in, in any substantial way. It's, I mean, it's in OT in the sense that I, I've published it in AJOT and keep talking about it. Uh, but uh, uh, as far as I know, the only other, um, other people uh, working with children with uh, uh, autism, I think, are using sensory anchors, but in a different way than I'm talking about it. So you may encounter the term uh, uh, and it may be used differently. Um, but mine is really about this embodied type of thing that you develop through experience and that guides you uh, on your, your occupation so that you can focus on other things and not have to attend to everything. So think about it. if you had to 
attend to every aspect of every occupation every time you undertook that occupation, you would not get anything done. You need habits to be able to do higher order things. And those habits, you know, uh, according to my research, are supported by those anchors, the sensory anchors. Great. Uh, certainly an area for continued exploration. Um, mm -hmm. From your experiences uh, thus far, do you have any insights into how long it takes to develop an anchor or create like a new one yeah. uh, for people? Any thoughts on that? Well, it, it's going to take a lot. Uh, so the research on habit formation shows that, what is it, uh, approximately the average is something like 60 or 66 repetitions uh, to form a habit. And that's a big average. So, you know, less complex habits take less time. More complex habits will take more time. So when I think of sensory anchors, you know, I guess it depends on the complexity of the action that you're trying to develop a sensory anchor with. So it could, you know, take more or less than 60 reps. I guess it really depends on the situation. Um, it's going to take a while. Any habit takes a long time to establish. Um, and usually a lot of times you have to, uh, when you're establishing a new habit, that a lot of times means uh, 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 getting rid of an old habit. And the inertia of habits is just a really difficult thing to, to overcome. So, you know, the key with habit formation, including sensory anchors, or I mean, I guess sensory habits, which are looking for sensory anchors, right? The sensory anchors are actually in the environment. So to develop that sensory habit of the sensory anchor, of seeking it, um, it's got to take a lot of time. Yeah. And so repetition, repetition under very similar contexts um, uh, with as little variation as possible. Uh, the research shows that that's how you would develop such a thing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, here's another question. I have a brother with paranoid schizophrenia. Neurodiversity is a great term. So if someone is born with atypical sensory processing, is the environment somewhat responsible for SMI progressing with time? 100%. This is where the justice comes in. This is where normative expectations for sensory processing come in. So a person's born with different sensory processing. Um, I, I like to say atypical just because it's not common. Uh, you notice I'm not saying sensory processing deficit, right? Their, their, their sensory processing is different. They engage with the world differently. But then the world is built with those normative expectations. So it's built in a way by us humans that, it, you know, if you have that certain sensory processing uh, pattern that you're not going to integrate as well, you're not going to embody as well. And so, yes, I would say that, you know, you um, uh, that our uh, uh, our society, our sociocultural ways of being then uh, increase the so-called disability. Uh, because of the lack of, uh, of uh, integration that a person experiences, because of the stigma they experience, because of then the services that they receive, the labels they get, the messages they get. People with SMI often get messages directly from their psychiatrist that they will not succeed, they will not be able to have jobs, and that's wrong. But it's, it's, the, it's the reality. So yeah, I think you, you know, you're born different, and then uh, the different environment just exacerbates that difference such that you're so alienated that you, um, you know, it just compounds the the impact. You know, research in uh, that compares this, uh, hallucinations uh, across cross culturally. There was a really cool study. I wish I could think of it at the top of my head. I want to say it starts with a G, but they compared uh, the nature of hallucinations between India, Ghana, and the United States. So these are all people with schizophrenia, diagnosed schizophrenia, but their hallucinations were culturally bound. Uh, people uh, in Ghana and India were, were uh, expressing much more positive hallucinations and people in the United States were experiencing much more negative and persecutory hallucinations. So that's kind of a, a demonstration on how this one biological uh, predisposition then is shaped by the culture in which you are in, which completely manifests its effect on your function. So the person in the United States with the hallucinations was experiencing it as a significant impact on their functioning, whereas in Ghana and India, uh, it wasn't quite so impactful on their mental health and well-being. Great, thank you very much. Here's a different question for you. Can you talk more about any connections between sensory experiences that could be influenced by social interactions and another person's sensory experiences. Ooh, love it. We're is about is co-regulation a factor for people with SMI? Uh, I would say all people uh, 
can be talked about in this way where, yeah, we're, we're social beings. Uh, we, I, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk uh, uh, yesterday on how we have a social brain. We're born incapable of regulating ourselves, incapable of meeting our basic needs. And as infants, we, we, we are dependent on our caregivers to, realist, to regulate our, our allostasis, you know, our hunger, our temperature, and so on. And we become dependent on our caregivers uh, uh, for that regulation. So then we start associating social stimuli or social participation with well-being, with regulation. And so as we keep going and keep uh, uh, participating, because we highly value social participation because we're, we become hardwired at the beginning, then um, you, uh, my research has shown, and I'm not the only one, by the way, if you, if you look into uh, anthropology, geography, there's a lot more research that sort of supports my way of thinking here. So this is, not, I'm not at all like a unique thing here, a unique person, but that through a, this social participation, one person orients the other to a, a, um, a form of a somatic attention, if you will. Like, so you encounter the environment and then a caregiver or a parent will orient the child to a, a certain aspect of the sensory experience. And if they repeat that, then the child may, uh, will start re uh, repeating that. So it's actually this co-regulation is, is extremely important. Uh, if you look into, um, I wish I could remember the author off the top of my head, but this idea of participatory sense making, where when we engage with people, we couple with them, and then we orient ourselves towards similar meetings and similar we we um, uh, uh, and similar sensory orientations. We affect each other that way. Uh, personally, and I said this again yesterday, but uh, with my kids, I see this all the time. I have twins, and I'm constantly orienting their sensory attention uh, to different environments, and I have seen them subsequently then orient me. In the same way, they're just repeating. Uh, they've embodied that sensory orientation. So, like, we go out, and I'm pointing out the sunset every day, uh, and then they start doing the same thing. Or I started pointing out, um, you know, uh, these uh, squirrel nests that we started seeing, and now they're starting to point that out to their friends. So they're, when they go to a, a trees now, they're looking for certain things that we share together that they're now communicating to other people. So, uh, in my opinion, that's that's exactly how we we embody these social habits is through meaningful participation with our social environment. This coupling where we share our somatic attention such that it affects our uh, subsequent uh, um, sensory experiences. Great. And along that line, um, do you have suggestions regarding both assessment and treatment of individuals with attachment disorder? then as we view it through this sensory lens kind of fits with what you're talking about there yeah uh that's that's a really tough question because i know how to do it but i mean I, I guess the crux of the issue here is how individual these things are and also how dynamic so habits you know they have an inertia to them absolutely they're difficult to break but they're not permanent and they are modifiable and so i would say that um there there has to be some possibility of of habit training, sensory habit training then. Uh, and a lot of it might have to do with this sort of cognitive behavioral approach where you really um, address the interoceptive piece of it, where you, you, you highlight things to a person so that they're aware of what they're experiencing and how it's impacting their, um, their environment. And that you can then maybe co-develop um, uh, uh, solutions to enhance functioning. Um, but I, you know, I am a, a huge believer in client-centered approaches. I, I will never, uh, the only protocol I will accept is a protocol of being flexible and, uh, and, and, and client-centered. Uh, but um, so there, there's no one size fits all because you, the person may have attachment disorder, but they also have this whole history this whole occupational history, the sensory history that affects that experience as well. And so, um, and that's unique. Um, you know, we're, we're all very similar, but we're also absolute unique collections of experiences and embodiments that um, a protocol will never serve you well. Great, thank you. We are um, running short of time. So this will be our last question of this session. And the question is, is desensitization an approach, appropriate approach for trauma. So kind of bringing back the sensory and the trauma perspective. Um, yeah, so I have to say I'm hesitant to answer that question because I, I, I'm not uh, familiar enough with the whole process of desensitization. I know that that's a, a, an aspect uh, that people uh, um, 
do uh, particularly for uh, heightened sensory sensitivities the thing about trauma that you got to be really careful is you don't want to re-traumatize people so you know desensitizing somebody to something can be really tricky because you might re-incur uh, an experience of trauma so i would be very careful with that kind of intervention i'm not saying it's not uh, a possibility or effective but you certainly don't want to keep traumatizing the person so um yeah i think uh, again really working closely with somebody and being very cognitive about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how it might have an impact, maybe even like writing down charts where you're, you're, you're talking about risks that you have and like how you might uh, handle it. Uh, just being very uh, open and transparent about the intervention and how it might work would be really important there um, because trauma is serious and it's, it's, it's intense and you definitely don't want to trigger it. Thank you, Dr. Bally. I appreciate that so much. And um, I would like to just let the audience know that we will send um, Dr. Balliard's references and PowerPoint that will come in an email uh, following completion of our day sometime next week or so. So those will be available for you. So I'd like you to join me in a huge applause for Dr. Antoine Balliard. Thank you so much for helping us really see the impact of sensory processing and, and how it can have an impact on all of our abilities to participate and to truly enjoy participation. And I think the last would be for us to keep thinking contextually. Everything is so contextualized. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much. It was a, it was a terrific pleasure. I just wish I could be there. <laughs> I look forward to the day that you will be here and that we can uh, perhaps have a cup of coffee and and have some conversations about so much of this. Yeah. So we are now going to take a 15 minute break and then following that break, you will have opportunity to attend two of the four breakout sessions. So when you're ready to hop back in, remember it'll be a new link. So go back to the OT Knowledge Exchange website and use the individual link to do that. Each presenter will present twice. So choose one and then choose a second one. So we'll uh, look forward to seeing you in a few minutes. Thank you.